Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for another episode of Security Matters. Um, I want to give a shout out to my uh, Sea Arise group who took care of the studio the last couple of weeks. I had uh, jury duty, so thank you, Sea Arise. I think they did a great job, a couple of good episodes. Um, not to be done out, I'm going to bring you some interesting information today. We have Yaron Zusman with us. Uh, Yaron is the director of Magos America. Um, if you're not a radar person, you may not know that name yet, but if you're not a radar person, you ought to be. Um, I'm going to give you a um, some in not as it insider information or when you do, do a reveal, but I'm an old uh, radar Navy guy. I started with the old ANSPS 39 shipboard radar. Um, that was my first piece of gear I worked on. I love radar. It's very powerful. And we're going to get into technology, but first let's meet Yaron. Yaron, I know you're a busy guy, uh, so thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Aloha. And thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thanks, man. So I'd like to get my guest, uh, you know, for I know you're, you've been around the industry a while and a lot of people probably do know you, but maybe just give us your history a little bit, um, sort of uh, as much as you care to share. You know, we don't give it all away on social media these days and then um, kind of bring us up to the, you know, to Magos America uh, today. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so I uh, basically grew up in Israel, came to the U.S. when I was uh, around 23. So now I can say about half my life I've been in the U.S. now. Uh, and uh, basically all my life wanted to be in the security industry. No, just kidding. Fell into the industry like anybody. <laughs> Fell into the industry like everybody else. You know, in 2003, I was actually working for an IT consulting company. I was living in New York City. I was uh, a little bored at the time and I met a VC that I knew. And for some reason, I impressed him. And he said, I have five companies I work with. Me, go meet the CEOs. They're all early stage. Uh, one was in the space I was in, wasn't interested. And the other happened to be actually in the security industry. And that's how I started. And the company in 2003 was called DVTEL. Uh, wow. And I ended up being there for, uh, for a good chunk of my career. So about 12 years. Uh, did that, everything from, because the company when, uh, when I started was, was very young. We were a handful of people. And really did everything in that company from folding brochures to cleaning the floor, you name it, uh, <laughs> running a territory, uh, then putting together a BD organization, a strategic account organization, eventually running the, the sales organization, uh, went through amazing, amazing schooling in that company, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, we were a rocket ship, we we're going very, uh, so really, really, I, I always say I, uh, I learned a ton in that company. Uh, 2010, we got out of the financial crisis. So I'm like, all right, things are going good. What can we do? So, uh, I'm, I'm, so I went, I actually did a, an executive MBA in Rutgers. And then I said, okay, what next? So uh, then I met a very interesting uh, person also from Israel, uh, used to be the head of uh, Israeli military intelligence. And he did something that today sounds trivial, but at the time was very new, which is uh, we're going to do facial recognition for access control which is a company that was called FST Biometrics. And I ended up running that company in the US. I was the CEO of that company. Amazing time again, uh, great three, three and a half, four years. We were, ahead of, uh, we were ahead of the game in terms of the concept, but we did have major, major customers, you know, brand names that uh, bought into uh, the idea. What we didn't think about is that access control needs to work 100% of the time, all the time. Today with machine learning and AI it works, but uh, we, uh, we had some challenges there. So the company actually pivoted more to the retail side and the less sensitive opening the door and uh i've been uh, but really all again very exciting uh up, a very exciting uh time that i had in that company and then also i got involved through uh a good friend of mine who was actually originally the ceo of dvtel he was running an incubator in israel that incubator uh, was the Tyco incubator in israel and through that i met a lot of the companies and that's actually how i met uh magus which is the company i work with now and I met them and I saw what they're doing and I realized, hey, we're, this, is, this is amazing. You know, there's, uh, they're really, they really took technology that should be in every application uh, on the perimeter, but used to be extremely expensive. Uh, with that also, uh, Tyco did invest in the company as a strategic investor, which having a strategic investor such as Johnson Control or Tyco at that point, uh, so in 2018, we started the company in the U.S. And since then, it's been uh, as easy as can get. No, I'm just kidding. It's been really hard, but, uh, <laughs> but life has been, uh, but it's been challenging, but it's been fun. You know, we've been growing. We've been educating the market on radars. Uh, and 2020 actually has been uh, with all the challenges and everything. It's been a great year for us in terms of growth. And this is, uh, this is where we are today. So again, very excited. Usually, 
uh, people like to say I'm glutton for punishment when nobody knows about a technology or nobody believes it's going to work. I'm going to go in and try to see if we can do it. So, but it's been till now, many years in the industry, it's been fun. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's pretty much the history of uh, of the elevator pitch. That's incredible. I love the optimism because um, you know if no, if someone doesn't believe something will work, then everybody, no one ever tries it, right? So you, we've got to have people that get out there and push technology. So I, I really appreciate that what you've done for the industry. BBTel was a big name. I mean, um, wow, you know they're uh, global, yeah. As as far as I recall, their penetration was everywhere. Yeah, I know it was. Uh, we were one of the first. We're actually the, the story, and this is a whole different talk show. But the story, BBTel was the first reseller of Genetech in the US. Genetech was ah. a software company in uh, Canada and Evitel was marketing them globally. And, uh, and then through the years, obviously that evolved to, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was really the, at that time, I call it, we were like the IP pioneers. It was us, it was Axis, it was Bosch, uh, Milestone. And we were all friends because we were like fighting the, the big old DVR guy. Yeah, right? yeah. So, we were the pirates at the time, but uh, it was great, uh, great time. You know, 2003 to uh, now, everything is IP and everything. But, but it was always winning that first large customer. If it's a big airport, or or uh, you know, uh, a lot of big enterprise customers. We had pretty much Silicon Valley, a lot of the big uh, companies, and just winning all those jobs at the beginning. You were actually competing with people. Why IP? The network is going to fall. What is you know? Uh, people just didn't believe in in IP for so long in this industry. So uh, I would say we were successful because we had no other company. If somebody sold IP, say, oh, you don't like it, I have a DVR. I didn't have a DVR. If I lost the business, <laughs> I lost the business. So, so that's why I think we were more hungry, we we're more aggressive, and uh, we we're uh, more successful eventually. That's a great story. Um, so let, let me ask you a question. Did, the, did what you went through in 08, 09, you know, in 10, how did that uh, help prepare you for when, you know, when the pandemic hit this year, you had another sort of a startup trying to get launched in North America and then the pandemic hit. Um, were there some lessons you brought from those days forward that helped you guys get through? Absolutely. Uh, so I think the biggest thing that you learn is that the thing that you can control 100% is your expenses, right? That's hmm. you can't control the revenue that's going to come in. You can't control your expenses as a company. So, so the tightening of that rope and making sure that you you don't know what's going to happen, right? So March, when that thing started happening around, I'd say mid-March, uh, we really tightened the belt on expenses, right? Everything. You look at every expense possible and said, okay, this, uh, if it's salary reduction, it's just all those things. Of course, with everybody involved, from me to the rest of the employees, but also giving everybody hope that once we are out of it, everything plus will be, uh, will be compensated back. So... So absolutely. And, and I think through, through the years, through day, you know, you make, you learn so much, you make so many mistakes, uh, you know, at, at DVTA, I made every mistake possible from hiring to, <laughs> to thinking. Uh, and one of the presentations I usually do is I can save you time because I made all the mistakes possible. But I think a lot of those things come uh, and then you learn it and you make the same mistake twice sometimes because you think you got smarter, but uh, but I think all of those things constantly you learn and then you adapt and then you go on. So so controlling your expenses, not panicking, understanding that, uh, hey, it's, it's temporary and then realizing, hey, let's innovate how we do business. And, and again, 2020 ended up, you know, March, April was very, very scary. Uh, but then, 2020 ended up a great year for us as a company. So I uh, can't complain, you know, we, it's uh, our investors are happy. Everybody's happy. Now it's a new year. So, you know, it's, uh, we started from scratch. Yeah. It's like, it's like so many of us are, are, are re, kind of restarting again. And I, I don't know about you, but it, it feels like maybe the bar has been actually raised a little bit because we all got more capable. We were able to go remote. We were able to still conduct business. Uh, everyone's travel budget went to zero or at least their spend went to zero. Uh, so you could use that money in different ways. I've heard a lot of folks talk about that. Um, how, um, can you talk about how how a large your your staff was at the beginning, and then how how you worked through that, and did everyone go remote? Just give us a little sense of what um, sort of models went through internally. So so we're uh, so we're young, right? And we have R and D in Israel, and we have uh, okay. the guys here. So the office here has been. We have an office uh, actually in New Jersey. It's a it's a great office, but. Uh, 
but it was somehow remote anyway because we're traveling all the time so we try to be here like at least once or twice a week in israel it's a little was a little bit more radical at the beginning because in israel uh just through the lockdowns and everything and this is an r d organization so it's, it's a you know it's exchanging ideas and writing code and all of the and there you had with the lockdowns and then you had uh just not knowing what will happen so a lot of people were furloughed at the beginning and again as we saw the business pick up we started bringing people back and getting uh call everybody but here in the us uh we stayed on course because again we knew that uh we have mission we also had a lot of uh, the sales cycle for what we do is very long right so it's not that it's not that uh, deals that I started working in March will close in April. So we had a lot of uh, things that we we knew were cooking and we knew uh, luckily that our customers are also not so influenced of the pandemic. We're not in the consumer market. You know, we do a lot of work with data centers. We do a lot of work with utilities. Those are guys that have not necessarily, their budget has not been cut as much as uh, as other. We did have some car companies that we were working with, or rental car companies that we were working for. And that business mm. died, obviously, because they're not spending money right now. Uh, the revenue went there, almost to zero in one day, right? So, right. But but our core business in the core vertical markets we operate uh, ended up being okay. Just I think it was the shock of the pandemic initially that people were just okay, what's going to happen? And then from call it the, the business innovation that we had to come with, if it's technical training, if it's doing all remotely, I think it actually made the product much better because. You go in and you say, okay, I cannot travel to Hawaii to support you guys doing an installation of the utility, right? So how do we do that remotely now? So I think a lot of uh, the tools, and I heard somebody say yesterday, if this pandemic would be five years ago, we'll all be screwed. But what happened in that five years with Zoom and all of those technologies that came around just made it much more manageable in a way. So I think uh, I think from that point, um, a lot that will take, from it, I think will also influence into the future. I used to travel over 100,000 miles every year in the air. I don't see myself going back to that. I see myself going back to travel. I don't see myself going back to uh, to traveling those crazy amounts that we used to. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's um, I, I think that expectation of of you know delivering a, a bit of a solution discussion. You know, ha having remote ca capability is going to be a big piece of business going forward and. Um, I, I was I love to see everybody invest in training. Um, I saw some of the um, clips you folks had on some of your white paper stuff that was, I thought, really valuable to sort of explain for people. And they were well done, especially someone who doesn't understand the value uh, of, of radar and what it can bring to a scenario. So we're we're near the midpoint. I want to definitely get into radar technology. So we're going to we have to pay some bills. So we'll take about a one minute break and we'll be right back with you on. Hang on, everybody. We'll see you in a minute. All right, and we're back with Yaron Zussman of Magos America, and we're talking, well, we've been talking about Magos and Yaron's like amazing business expertise, um, but he's leading a company now that I think can lead this industry into a place that was really the realm of DOD in my experience as a radar guy. Radar has a massive, I think, opportunity to help us finally cover perimeter in a cost-effective way that we always needed. Um, that's my pitch about radar because I'm an old radar guy and I love it. We now my radar didn't work that good. I got to tell you, I was in the Persian Gulf and it was the, the air was full of sand and dirt, and we were kind of blinded. That's all I'm going to say is our our capability dropped. So we may talk about some of the vulnerabilities of radar uh, that maybe you guys have overcome. 
Uh, but let's let's talk about radar, the development of Magos a little bit, and, and, and the opportunity that you saw getting into the market, and then some of the projects that you've done um, to date. Sure. So so yeah. So the, the company actually started with a very clear vision that it started by uh, two brilliant engineers that uh, that actually did electro optic, did radars, uh, work mostly in the military and the academia, right? And uh, and they did that work and really investigated how radar should protect and used to protect, uh, like you said, DOD, right? Mostly, uh, actually, one of our founders been in the army for many, many years. Uh -huh. But then they realized through the expertise that with today's evolution of technology, right, uh, not moving far, all of those things, radar should not be that expensive, right? So, you know, when you think of radar, and it's funny because we were uh, last year, as is did a pitch competition, we actually won that pitch competition as a startup, but we start a pitch, right? When you think about radar, you don't think about innovation, right? You think it's a 50 year old technology. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so what's innovative about radar, right? So we start from, uh, it's not like this, uh, but what they did is really take radars and reinvent it and make it very, very small. Our radar is a very small device, make it an, made it, it's an IP device uh, and make it very, first and make it very affordable. And on the other side, we also took a lot of software and tied that software to make it speak to all the systems that are out there today. So we're integrated into uh, the variants and the, the new company that's very co right now, the Vigilant, the Genetex, uh, Milestone, and all of that. And with that GUI and that capability of the radar, we now make it a uh, very, very clear value proposition. Because when you look at the radar today, uh, a radar looks at, you know, we speak in meters, but about, you know, our smallest radar is about 250 meter, which is about 750 feet. And then it goes up to about 3000 feet, which is a one kilometer radar. And it looks at about 120 degrees. So the paradigm shift on the perimeter that usually when you hear a presentation from most of the companies at the perimeter, you need fixed cameras in the perimeter, and then you need PTZs to be two in tours. We, in a way, we shatter that because we say, no, you need four or five radars around the perimeter with those PTZs, but those PTZs are now very smart because we move the PTZs based on the target that you detect, right? So each one of those radars looks at 120 degrees in vertical, and then it also has an elevation of about 30 degrees. So now you cover per square meter, uh, your economics just makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I am. Um... I, I don't know, uh, will that, um, you know, I think, I don't think people think about a perimeter, but, you know, people have, have seen fence solutions, right? Well, people can go under and over them. So when you talk about having vertical dimensionality as well as horizontal dimensionality, that's where radar gains a whole lot of value because you just can't move in that field of view without detection. And detection problems have been something that we've suffered with many of the different types of solutions that we built in the industry. Either A, like a fence system is only good on the fence. Right or be you know you motion to get to the good fence in order to trigger it right so exactly you yeah fence companies but we trigger before so fence, I'm not saying I'm here to replace your fence although some people do replace because yeah. they, they they don't want the fence they say okay I can but we work a lot with we we have radars on fence line a yeah. lot of the time but if but we detect way before they get to the fence right so yeah. the detection is is way before that. Yeah, which is so valuable, right? And so this is this is the I think sort of the revolution that people may not understand is you get a lot more coverage from different types of attacks, you might say, whether it's a little bit elevated, it's not necessarily someone just on the ground, but it's someone also in the air because you have that vertical dimensionality of, of a radar. Um, what are what are we talking about from a uh, a footprint perspective? You you mentioned so you got 120 degrees, so I could see you know three or three or four could easily cover 360 degrees of a space, and you said maybe out to 700 feet or out to maybe a thousand meters. Um, and then is that a typical sort of thing, or are you going like along uh, uh, oil pipelines as well, or is it typically more you know like in a a, a longitudinal fashion, or is it more of a of a of a you know square like a stadium type application so so it's uh, it's mixed right we have uh, we have projects that are exactly that protect if it's a pipeline or uh, or okay. a canal or anything from that matter but a lot of our work is really protecting around uh perimeter right so again okay. if you look at a perimeter that think about a typical data center right that's a big market for us right now so okay. when somebody builds a new data center their planning is usually traditionally has been you put 20 poles around the perimeter, you have fixed cameras, you put analytics, you put, uh, and this is all great, uh, but a lot of, 
a lot of the consultants that see our products say, wait, I can now put five poles around the perimeter. So it's not <laughs> only the cost of the radar, it's the cost of your IP ports, it's the cost of maintaining the system later, it's the cost of ownership over the long term. And really it allows you, I said the PTZ manufacturers love us because we help them sell the most expensive PTZs, right? So if we work with, with FLIR or with Axis or with Videotech or any of that one of these guys, uh, we now take their cameras that are very good cameras, but we move them based on exactly a target there. And in a way, we like to say we make PTZ camera relevant again, because when I was yeah. a DV, not, my days at DVTEL, PTZs were always at the right place at the wrong time. You know, you right. look for something, the PTZ was doing a tour, it was busy. Now the PTZ is moving based on triggers from the radar, which I think is the unique uh, capabilities. And, and actually, even today, we've done, we went another step and we added what we call the AI to that. So we're actually classifying the targets as well. So we're telling you, hey, this target is a person, this target is a car, uh, this target is a vehicle, and also help you eliminate nuisance alarm. Because that's the biggest problem of the industry is nuisance alarm. Yeah. People, people shut down stuff because they, they're sick of getting those nuisance alarms and they're sick of getting that email. So we say, we'll give you an alert when it's really an alert or an alarm when it's really an alarm. Yeah, it's incredible. That is something, I mean, you know, we obviously, we, in the, in the DOD model, you know, we had that, but we always had people watching and we always had, you know, a second layer of verifying, you know, operators today don't have time to, to act upon, you know, bad intelligence, right? They really, cause that, that, that alarm fatigue will wear them out quickly. And then they're like, oh, this doesn't work. I'm not paying attention. So it's that value of getting a real alarm when it's really worth looking at is something that's, that shouldn't be overlooked. I think that if, People haven't experienced that or worked in that environment. They just don't understand how valuable that proposition is. And to now start to feed it, I love the idea of having some, some ML or AI baked into that that starts to give them. Because if it's a vehicle approaching, what's the rate of speed? Or, or the what's my uh, playbook for an approaching vehicle that's unknown, for example, versus someone on foot or, you know, 10, 10 men on foot or whatever it may be. So it's, a, it's super valuable. You can provide that additional intelligence. Um, can we talk about the sort of functionality? I mentioned before some of the difficulties we had, and, and my radar was 60 years old, actually. So it was um, analog. You know what I'm saying? We troubleshot to the component, you know, bad capacitor, bad yeah. transistor. But um, it, let's talk about the, a modern uh, radar adaption, uh, adoption. Um, are there environmental variables, or how do you overcome some of the variables that we experience with some of the older technology in, in our environment uh, when operating radar? So, so actually, if we look at the, what we call the, the MIMO radar, we have the multiple inputs, multiple outputs, and the radar takes care a lot of the, call it the environmental stuff. We don't care about, actually, my best demos are rain and snow, because you don't see anything, <laughs> but the radar works. But radar does have its diseases, as we call it, right? Because uh, radar, radar staring uh, in a busy area is going to lag a lot of noise, which is clutter, right? And will create... Uh, so um, radar in general, radar likes radio movement, meaning that you come to it. If you, so if I say a radar works for 500 meters, if I do tangible movement to the radar, which is a harder for radar to detect because that works in Doppler, uh, there is going to be, so the, the distance of detection is going to be shorter than the maximum rate of the radar. And we do, sure. we have a, we call radar 101. We say about plan, for example, you know, a tree can create a lot of clutter. It will not create an alarm because we know that the tree is moving, but you hiding under the tree are not going to be detected as a person, right? When you get out of the tree area, it will detect you. So there are things like if something creates a lot of clutter or noise to that radar and you're hiding behind it, it'd be okay. But, uh, but from that, it's, it's like the diseases of a lot of, uh, call it, uh, you don't want to put it in front of a wall because it's going to block the radar. Sure. Um, but again, if we look at that versus, uh, you know, I, I used to sell analytics, right? We had a, one of the best ones in the market called IO Image, uh, DVTEL owned, and it's a great product. But the calibration process, the, uh, the, all of those things, when I saw this technology, and that's where I decided to sign up and build this thing here in the U.S., was seeing the, uh, the cost benefit, right, as uh, what you put in. What you have to install, how much less infrastructure, how much less power. It's a three watt device, right? It's a one oh, cable wow. to the device. That's when I realized, okay, this is this can be a game changer on a niche market on the perimeter, but can be a game changer. And uh, and again, right now, uh, it looks like uh, like that's the right track. We are seeing the adaptation uh, being amazing, so it's great. Yeah, I uh, I we I'm I'm hoping to see a whole lot more of that proliferate. Is the um. How, how is North America, how's the market? Are they, is, you still need a lot of education? Are you having 
uh, getting a lot of sessions going? Or are you still finding people are like, wow, I, I didn't know. A lot of people just aren't familiar with radar. So I didn't know how the how you find the market space here. So, uh, so we're seeing a very, very good adaptation. So there is uh, the utility space has been looking at radar for a long time, and some of them have been deploying radar for a long yeah. time. Uh, so we have to educate them why our radar, right? So that's uh, okay. that's uh, from that point. Data centers, uh, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing them very willing to listen and deploy. We're doing a lot of data centers. It's probably our second largest uh, vertical market today outside of the utility space. And again, we see them because because they have to protect them, they're critical sites. Uh, you know, they have the, that combination of logical worrying about hacks, but also where, worrying about physical getting into the data center. Sure. So that they're willing to look at any technology that can help them build. And a lot of them, uh, fulfillment center is another one that we're seeing. So anything that is in a remote location and the area is uh, has a perimeter, we're seeing uh, people willing to listen, but but. There is a lot of aha moments like I had when I saw it first time. A lot of the time we do webinars, people are like, wow, I did not think that that's what we can do, right? So but we're seeing more and more. And also we have some great partnership, right? So the partnerships are key. Uh, integrators that, uh, that have adapted, have been early adapters, and like any other technology that is out there, you need the early adapters. So do the work and install and get out there before the rest come on board. So that's been always a challenge, but that's once you have them, once the early adapters are in, they feel it's part of their success that's rolling out your program. So they become ambassadors for your product. And, and we're seeing that, like I'd say, in every vertical market that we have, uh, we have an ambassador. So one of excellent customer of ours is actually Yale University. You say, what the heck is the university needs uh, radars? And Yale University, their athletic field, they needed to protect because there was some areas there and their athletics is open. It's a great area. And just instead of blanketing it with cameras, a couple of radars, we were able to help them really solve an exist a real problem, right? So, so there's a lot of those that uh, we're able to do. And, uh, and again, that's, that's where we've been really focusing on finding the right partners to work with and, uh, and going to business. Awesome. I love it. I, I think it's going to be such a, a game changer for protecting our critical infrastructure, which, you know, I have a, I have a passion for national security. So uh, whatever we can do to help, please let me know. Uh, check out uh, Magos America, folks. Get a hold of Yaron if you need a demo. Um, Radar can definitely change your application and, and help your customers protect their assets, protect their people. Yaron, I really appreciate you joining me today. Great session. I'm sure we'll talk again soon, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. Aloha. <laughs>